I want to welcome Yossi Cohen, former director of the Mossad and former head of the National Security Council in Israel and currently the head of SoftBank in Israel. Welcome, Yossi. Good morning, sir. Thank you. We're approaching November 29th, the presumed date of uh, resumed talks between the superpowers and Iran on a, maybe a new nuclear agreement. Is there still anything to talk about with the Iranians or all our or are they already breaking out away from any supervision, safeguards, straight to the bomb? Well, the current situation actually is um, absolutely complicated since there is an agreement that the Iranians do not respect and there are some um, achievements that has to be, have to be achieved in the negotiations if to be resumed by the powers in Iran. Like what? The Iranians today are enriching because they can enrich. Both bankers that are holding uh, advanced centrifuges of a more advanced um, uh, type that had been in the past are rotating and enriching uranium to the level that the Iranians decide. This is something, in my opinion, that has to be absolutely seized and, and, and stopped. And I think when we discuss the cycle of the nuclear fissile materials, this is something that has to be eventually rearranged or, in my... Broken apart. In, in a way. Broken apart from the entire agreement, because I, I believe that broken apart completely, I mean, to destroy, yeah. the, to destroy the facilities is something that has to be done by this agreement completely. Because of what? Iran today enriches because it can and because of its own decision. If the agreement would have taken all its capabilities and not their willingness, they are willing to have a nuclear bomb. Let's say they had it. That's a different story. But let's assume they are willing to have a nuclear bomb. Since they have the capabilities to enrich, and since they are holding the entire um, fissile materials cycle, as we call it, they can decide themselves when and for how, but is it, but and for how long or how much But isn't they it can too enrich? late, as former Prime Minister Barak suggested, that it's already too late and that we have to learn to live with the possibility of uh, an Iranian nuclear bomb in the no, near future? No, I think it's never late. Actually, first, I mean, we have to all the time put, put statesmen in, in front of our eyes. One is that Israel will never let the Iranians to hold a nuclear military nuclear capability. This is something that we have to adapt ourselves in our new can Israel all really, the time. Can Israel go it alone without superpower cover, without American support? I think that Israel should have the ability to fight this uh, aspect alone, like we did twice in the past. I mean, when Iraqis have decided to go onto the nuclear military path, uh, path, we have attacked it. When the Syrians did the same with the help of North Korea, we did the same. I but in a much less sophisticated program with one, with one major facility rather than bunkers and thousands of... I, I, I assume that it's going to be complicated militarily, uh, operationally, but I don't think that it is impossible. But I think that if the State of Israel will decide to get, if I may read of this program, that the Iranians do not really need for them uh, protection, we can do it, and we will have to do it. And, uh, but you know, sev several of your predecessors, and the, and the head of Mossad, like Efraim Alevi, and uh, Tamir Pardo, and I, and I would assume that the late Mayor Dagan would have agreed, criticized Netanyahu's decision to convince, or to, to convince Trump to let go, to leave the nuclear agreement uh, three I, years ago, I, and that and they argued that, and they, they're not alone, argued that this was a major blunder for Israeli right. strategy. I don't think that all the names mentioned um, would have agreed with one political or diplomatic structure uh, towards Iran. I mean, Israeli system is different. I mean, we're very uh, uh, colored, if I may, I mean, in our versions of uh, holding this uh, diplomatic asset. My opinion is, and it was my opinion when I was deputy director of the Mossad, when I was, as mentioned, national security advisor to the prime minister and, of course, director of the Mossad, that we, as Israelis, should do our utmost to get rid of their capabilities within negotiations. This would be the best, of course, if Iran would come clean. Yeah, but Israel, but Israel's, uh, Israel persuaded the United States uh, 
to leave the agreement, we to, to let shown, the Iranians go we on their own. The, we had shown the Americans, and I believe the world within the American society, that Iran lied all the way to the deal. It lied because it was uh, not coming clean with many issues and subjects that were hidden from the world and from us too. That was, by the way, the main target of the so-called the archive, the nuclear archive operation. We had to bring materials from within the military group, from within the group of yeah, Muslim but, but you brought today, materials to prove that Iran is holding better yeah, and but, better but, capabilities but than it, we but, knew. But even if you won the PR, the PR case, still they're enriching uranium more than they did when when the agreement was still there. So this is, you this have is a major true. operational success. This is true. But, but I was honored, really honored, to be one of the prime negotiators by the State of Israel with the P5 plus one when uh, President Obama was the president and my counterparts were negotiating. Susan Rice as national security um, advisor, Wendy Sherman, undersecretary of John Kerry, etc. And we were explaining then, not only to the American allies and colleagues of ours, but to the world entirely, to the P5 plus one and the IEA in Vienna as well, that a good agreement is possible. That a good agreement means close up to a complete shutdown. These two bunkers that you've mentioned, Aluf, this is absolutely right. There is a major question here. Why does Iran enrich? Why do they need Enrichment no, but they do so, so, so they, you, do, they do not so you had a PR success and you know and many many other operations uh, attributed in uh, the foreign media to Israel or to Mossad mm -hmm. to other uh, other names of, uh, of uh, and, and euphemisms of Israel right to destroy this facility that facility that centrifuge to kill uh, that scientist or engineer or whatever but still they're enriching more uranium so you may have the, operational and, success and, and, and strategic and, and, and strategic this uh, such, collapse. Such, this is such a good question because strategic if failure. You, if you ask, ask yourself, why is it that Iran can enrich? Because of a decision, they can enrich Iranian uh, uranium as they want due to their own decision. Yeah, but they're if not they deterred have, by. But they're not but deterred. If, you know, if you kill if one scientist, the own, others are still coming uh, to work. If they haven't had their capability to enrich, this would not be the case. My request was, and still today, resuming the talks within, let's say, a few days, is that these two bunkers and the enrichment capability will be dismissed completely. Then there is not a discussion between us and the Americans and the Chinese and the Russians and the three E's and the IEA in Vienna about what's going to be the future of Iran on that sense, because the major problem of this agreement is that it has limit in time. And that it leaves it would, it would infrastructure it, it, in there. It leaves yeah. infrastructures, not only that. Scientists and their science capabilities are is growing. Facilities have been, have been improved, both. Natanzan Fordo is not a Tanzan Fordo of 2015. Well, yeah, and and th that well, was allowed. Well, this is my argument that with covert action, you cannot just you know, you, you can, uh, you can uh, damage it, but it not, I, cannot I, destroy it altogether. You can, you can damage it. You can kill one time scientist, can, ten scientists, can slow, not you, I agree with you totally. You can damage, you can slow down their capabilities. Every single thing that we had been, according to four reports, doing in Iran is to make sure that they keep enough distance of capabilities, not of willingness, from the bomb. That was it. And then, if we did what we did, and let's say that was in our asset strategic item to do or to keep this distance as it is, I think that we've done it correctly. Up to date, Iran is not closer to the bomb than it was in the past. It is not closer than it was before the agreement. It is not closer because they violate the agreement. This is not the case. It is true that there is all the time a kind of a need on the Iranian strategy understanding to go into more sophisticated facilities, capabilities, and advanced centrifuges so they can enrich uranium better. 
I think that the world should ask itself one major question. Why is Iran enriching? They do not need any enriched uranium rather for to use it in a nuclear weapon. And this is something that the State of Israel, National Security Advisor then, um, not, and not too late to go, government, the Mossad, I, I opposed and, and, and that you, dramatically. And you think that the current government in Israel is following the same strategy? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, as, don't far, think that the change as, far, of government as far changing. as I know, I believe that the State of Israel of two dates, the Prime Minister, National Security Advisor to the Prime Minister of today. He was one um, of your he was, subordinates. He was, he was one of my subordinates, yeah. uh, Dr. Yal Khulata. Um, they're absolutely updated of the Iranian deeds. And I think that they would run the same strategy as before, saying one thing. Iran could never acquire but was, but nuclear there, weapon, and instead of Israel would do everything but there was in its a, capabilities to make sure that it will not happen. There was an argument that there was a lot of action, but not a real strategy of how to deal with if, in case the agreement fails and so on. In case of the agreement that, that fails. That during the Netanyahu government, you were, you know, there was some inner circle it was, of people. I, I, just a little reminder, I yeah. think it is important, uh, Aluf, uh, it was a very long process. I mean, Obama's administration's engagement with Iran was longer than the last term. It was longer than four years. Then we got part of the negotiations. We're trying to make our best influence as in between friends, as in between always America and Israel. Not conflicting each other, but maybe seeing things differently from different views. And Crystal Ball, are they going to resume, to reach an agreement, a new agreement with Iran? I'm not sure if today is possibilities to reach an agreement, because in Iran there were some changes too. Yeah. Ibrahim Raisi is not the nice face of Iran as uh, Rouhani was. Um, he is much more um, extreme in his uh, uh, regional views than his, uh, prede uh, than his predecessor, and I am, I'm not sure that I Iran will agree to run the so, same So Crystal Ball, you see motion without movement? I see motion with a lot of uh, emotion, um, and, and <laughs> but I, then again, it falls back to the to the Israeli decision makers to, to find out, to find a way to deal with it without you know, counting on the superpowers to do the job. The best thing would Israel. be that if Israel and America, which is eventually the best, absolute best friend of the state of Israel ever, will decide together as President Biden has recently declared. And I was honored to see Mr. Biden myself yeah. on my last month of my term at the director of the Mossad. And it was agreed, not only with me, but with the Prime Minister of Israel afterwards as well, that Iran, to both of us, will never be allowed to acquire nuclear weapons. This is too dangerous for the region, too dangerous for the state of Israel entirely. Do you have uh, aspirations, as rumored, to be the not next now. prime minister? I mean, I'm, I'm, well, you're I'm, now in freeze or I'm not in politics today. Yeah. I'm absolutely in business. I invest most of my time to, I would say, to translate Zionism um, into these uh, economical assets that are super important for the, for the prosperity of the state of Israel. And, uh, and this, have, is, this and is what I do. you think about politics? Not now. Not now. And, uh, you know, there was an issue of... Uh, present you got from a, no, this from not a billionaire. This interview. I think that we discussed national security, not my private life, but... Uh, but did you find a way to give it back, as you said? Yes. Yes? It's, it's over? I hope it's over. I hope. Um, and last but not least, uh, the issue of NSO, uh, a company that sells cyber uh, offensive products, and now declared by the United States to be harmful to American interests. And uh, at the time, it was a lot of talk about how it helped Israel reach out to, you know, to more peaceful relations around the world. Do you see the conflict here? Do you think the Americans think, are I wrong in this? I think, I think that this story is um, absolutely sensitive. I know that officially this story has been dealt uh, in the right offices, and I'm, I don't have the uh, obligation nor the uh, uh, freedom to discuss this issue, with your permission. I see. Well, thank you, Yossi Cohen, for joining us and uh, for a very interesting, though less than optimistic, discussion about uh, Iran and its program. Thank you very much for having me this morning. Thank you very much, Aluf. Thank, thank you. you.
Hello, and thank you for joining us for a panel on Iran, Israel, the nuclear file, the negotiations, the biggest story right now in the news in the U.S.-Israel relationship. And when we talk about Israel's strategic challenges, we cannot ignore this one. And we have a great panel for our discussion today. With me in studio, Sima Shain, the head of the Iran program at the INSS here in Israel. Thank you for being with us, Sima. And Amos Arel, a national security correspondent and analyst for Haaretz. Hello. Thank you for joining us, Amos. And via Zoom, Dalia Dasake of the UCLA Berkel Center and Professor Avner Cohen of the Middlebury Institute. Thank you all for being with us. Uh, we have a lot to discuss. Uh, Sima, I want to start with you. A new government here in Israel looking at the United States about to enter renewed talks with Iran. What objectives can this government try to achieve? What should be the requests that come up in talks with the American side before these negotiations are renewed? So as you know, uh, Israel is quite worried from just going back. The question is, do you go back to what you go back? And this is, I think, uh, the, the problem. It looks, uh, from Israel's point of view, that the American administration is eager to uh, put back the Iranian issue in the box and going back to the agreement is this is the way to do it. So from Israel's point of view, I think it will be important to see that uh, the U.S. doesn't go for something that is called less for less or uh, less, uh, more for less, meaning more relief of sanctions for less uh, things that Iran will take upon itself on the nuclear sphere. Uh, this is one thing. The other one, which is not less important, is the question of what next? Uh, is it uh, an agreement that within several years will be uh, uh, will be uh, finished? Will the sunset will be within some, uh, several years, or is it going to be a platform for a longer and stronger? As the Biden administration has said at the beginning, that they would prefer to go back and then start negotiations for longer and stronger, which Israel would prefer, of course. Uh, at the end of the day, the main problem, the current main problem today is uh, that there is an, uh, a, an evaluation in Israel that Iran is just wasting time, trying to win uh, more and more time in order to improve its uh, position with the program, to have more uh, and reach uranium for 60 percent, for 20 percent, and to be in a better leverage vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, shortening the timetable for breakout. So I think it's a, a complex of issues that are very worrying Israel. But the good news, I would say, is that Israel, this government has decided to uh, have the dialogue with the U.S. To engage. In, exactly. In closed rooms and not in the press or in uh, speeches. No, no, we're not going to see Naftali Bennett flying to Congress. For Ag now. Exactly. And uh, Amos, I'm going to ask you in a minute about the r recent history of this issue and to have near some questions about more faraway history. But uh, Dalia, I want to ask you, uh, we, we spoke just with Sima about the new government in Israel. There is also a new government in Iran. What are the objectives for that government uh, when it comes into the nuclear negotiating room now? Yeah, well, uh, this is, uh, thank you for having me, a great session here. Um, the new government is, is certainly more hardline. The nuclear deal is a lower priority. They're much more focused on domestic. Uh, they are, I think, eager to show that they could get more than the previous government under President Rouhani. Of course, we have to caveat all, caveat all this by saying the supreme leader, you know, makes the final shots in Tehran. So new governments don't change things as much as, of course, in the case with Israel. Um, but it's clear that they would welcome sanctions relief. They are taking their time, though. Uh, they took many months to get back to negotiations that are going to resume later this month. Uh, the government was elected last June. Um, so they're not rushing into it. They're kind of mimicking the Biden administration that said they weren't going to rush into it. So they're playing that game. Um, and it's clear that they're going to want some new things uh, from this deal, which could make it very difficult. They're particularly interested in sanctions relief, verif verification of sanctions relief. They want some guarantees that the Biden administration or any future administration mm -hmm. in the U.S. is not going to leave the deal again, which, of course, is going to be hard to guarantee in a democracy. Um, but I do think that sanctions relief is still going to be the core issue. And in fact, I, I understand it, the way the deal has been spoken in Iran right now. It's, it's 
not called the Iran nuclear deal anymore. It's called the sanctions relief deal. So I think they're still, <laughs> um, yes, they have workarounds, but I think they're still interested in getting, even if it's short-term boost to their economy, they very much need that. Amos, in 2019, you wrote a column for us at Haaretz proclaiming that the Trump policy of maximum pressure on Iran, which was strongly encouraged at the time by former Prime Minister Netanyahu, has failed. And when, when we're looking today at the situation that Israel is facing with Biden and other allies going back to negotiations and Iran looking for the sanctions relief deal, as Dalia just described it, what is the legacy of Netanyahu and Trump on this issue when we examine it in 2021? Well, I'm glad somebody remembers, or at least I'm glad that I sent you the I, link to it. I bookmarked, yes. <laughs> Other than that, um, I, I think, yeah, I think history would judge uh, Netanyahu quite harshly on the Iran uh, portfolio. Which was the main issue that he, you know, presented to the world for many years. And there's a huge gap between the rhetoric about Nazi Germany coming back and uh, Iran being uh, the, the, the current version of Nazi Germany and saving the Jews from the Holocaust and what actually materialized. Netanyahu, as we know, applied pressure on Trump to withdraw from the nuclear agreement. This happened in 2018. A year or two later, the Iranians began uh, um, uh, in being in breach of the agreement. And finally, as uh, Sima has mentioned, they moved forward with enriching uh, uranium. Uh, the end result of that is that we're in a much more dangerous situation now than we were a year or two uh, ago. Netanyahu, what he hoped to achieve, I assume, was either that the maximum pressure and maximum sanctions would, uh, in the end, lead to the collapse of the regime, or that they would be under so much pressure that they would make a mistake, provoke President Trump, and lead to an American attack. And then none America these, gets the job done for yeah, Israel. None of these scenarios actually materialized, and Iran is where it is uh, right now. Bennett has to deal with, with all that, and on top of everything else, what he's been hinting for quite some time is that Netanyahu not only mis uh, misread the map, but also he neglected to prepare the IDF for such a scenario, meaning that for quite some time the IDF was not, especially the Israeli Air Force, were not, was not preparing for the military option, for striking um, unilaterally at uh, Iranian uh, nuclear sites. Now there's an ongoing discussion whether that was realistic to begin with. We all remember the Barack Netanyahu government in 2011, 2012. We remember the generals resisting the, uh, the whole idea. But, I mean, most people in Israel would agree that there needs to be at least an alternative, that somebody needs to work on those plans in case the worst case uh, scenario happens. It turns out that the IDF is quite um, some time behind this option, and now we're finding ourselves in, in a situation where we don't have many alternatives. In the end, Israel could, um, you know, complain a lot and whine a lot and, and, and try to affect the American positions, but I don't think that we have much leverage over the negotiations. Avner, after covering that recent history with Amos, I want to ask you if we go a little more uh, back in time and we look at a broader uh, view of this, what would it mean for Israel if Iran crossed the threshold apart from the threats? Because it would also mean losing a monopoly on this issue in the region. Well, the Israeli monopoly is terribly important, is invisible, but at the same time it's terribly important in terms of the uh, posture, the position, the place of Israel in the Middle East. Uh, losing it in the eyes of essentially all Israeli government, from Barak, including Bennett and Netanyahu, would, would undermine Israeli position in the region a great deal. Uh, for a long, long time, I thought that the issue was not uh, about Iran gaining the bomb or not, but it was a struggle about the distance that, allowed, that Iran would be allowed and ultimately would be pushing itself to be from the bomb. And I think what happened from 2019, actually there was a year of a little lull, a little hesitation on the side of Iran after Trump uh, left the, the agreement. But from 2019, Iran was moving fast in a variety of areas, in particular in the area of fission materials, to diminish the achievement and to undermine the, the achievement of the imperfect uh, GSPO, the agreement, the Iran deal of 2015. The result is that I don't think that Iran is on its way to have a break, breakout towards the bomb. I think they're sneaking towards the bomb. They're trying by the Salome uh, method 
to cut slice by slide and to be getting closer and closer to the threshold. Uh, the fact that they have significant amount of uh, uranium 60%, some 25% and, and much more 20%. And essentially the world is quiet about it. Uh, it was done uh, openly and they're moving and there is quiet, they are, they are, they are essentially, and there is no, there is no any methods to look and to monitor and to verify Iran and its progress in the areas of weaponization, militarizations, and all that, that's create a very dangerous situation. I don't think that Iran will have the bomb anytime very soon, but it creates a very dangerous situation. Sima, I want to go back to you and ask that in light of everything we just heard from Dalia and Amos and Avner, what is the better scenario for Israel, a new deal that it doesn't like? or a failure to reach a deal, and then we're not even sure what the consequences are. So first of all, I have to say that, uh, as you know, it's not, it doesn't depend on Israel. True. And in this case, and I completely agree with, uh, with Dalia, it doesn't uh, uh, depend on the US as well. Uh, it looks, and uh, as uh, I'm following the Iranian issue for a long time, it looks for me that uh, Iran actually doesn't want to go back. What Iran, of course, if Iran could get the relief of all sanctions. We just uh, get, got yesterday an article in the um, uh, newspaper of the government and has put the demands before the Americans. And one of them is remove, a removal of all sanctions during, from Obama to Trump and today. Nuclear related or no, all, all sanctions? sanctions? Okay, good course. luck. And they say the, this uh, issue of uh, terror and the human rights and others, that's not the issue. All sanctions that have been put on Iran should be removed. Nevertheless, of course, Iran should be compensated for what it has uh, suffered in the last two years, almost three years. So I think the, uh, what, if I'm looking on, on the terms that Iran is putting on the table, one could say it's only bargaining position, but I uh, intend to believe what Iranians are saying, that they mean it. And if they mean it and they want to bring to the table those demands, uh, also the demand not, uh, of the U.S. not to, to, to leave the agreement any time in the future, all these demands are impossible for the, U for the American administration. So I do think that we are much, much more in, uh, close to a scenario where nothing will happen uh, in Vienna around the table. Of course, it will not happen in this uh, meeting. Iran will do everything is needed in order to have a second meeting or a third meeting, uh, playing on the desire of the Biden administration to have an agreement. But at the end, it will be, and I think even the Americans are starting to say, Secretary Blinken has said, uh, there will be at a, a point in time in the future, and it's not far in the future, that the agreement will, there will be no uh, need to go, no uh, desire to go back to any agreement, and it will not be possible. So from that point of view, I think that uh, the question, what is better for Israel, it's a good question, but I don't think it is on, on the table. Israel, I think, um, would prefer to have uh, even if, it, if, you, if the U.S. goes back to the agreement, to have a, a, a beginning of a, of a commitment of, on the side of the Iranians to have a, a next phase of, a, of dialogue, which I don't think will happen. So uh, we are really catched in a situation where nothing is good. Not the Iran, that, uh, neither Iran going, uh, continuing with its program, as uh, Avner has just mentioned, which is very uh, Sneaking dangerous. to the bomb, as Sneaking to the bomb, exactly. Neither the other position that Iran will get relief of everything and will, uh, so, and, and the agreement will be, uh, the sunset will be in uh, several years. So we are really in a catch-22. <laughs> Amos, in the past, we saw, as you mentioned earlier, a lot of arguments within the Israeli leadership, mostly between political leadership and the, uh, you know, security, intelligence chiefs around the Iran policy. Are we seeing something similar happening today or not yet, a divergence between the elected officials and the intelligence and security chiefs? Not just yet. Uh, I think that when you look at, at uh, Bennett's uh, positions, at least uh, the outspoken uh, views that he ex expresses in different interviews and speeches and so on, it's not very different from not what Netanyahu has said, minus the Holocaust uh, 
talk. Without the exaggeration. Exactly. Uh, but I think that the change mainly is about the fact, and, and this has to do with everything Bennett does, is that he's very different. His conduct is very different. He, he comes from a, a party that has uh, six seats. He's not, you know, he, he's um, not an autocrat in, in any way, and he needs to govern through uh, uniting the different parties and so on. So he cannot afford to fight with the generals or the Mossad or Shin Bet chiefs or anything like that. So it's all about more of a freedom of expression, if you'd like, and having the professional, uh, professional level talk uh, directly to power and tell um, Bennett and others uh, what this is about and what they actually say. Uh, the best example for that was in the last days of Netanyahu when he sent uh, former chief of Mossad Cohen and uh, the chief of staff Kohavi and others to Washington, but he told them that they were forbidden to discuss possible negotiations between Iran and the U.S. because this is something that Israel is not willing Basically to going, live with. Going to Washington, but not talking about the most important issue with the exactly. new Biden administration. And this is why Kohavi avoided the mission altogether. I think, uh, I'm joking, but uh, some people have said that the escalation in Gaza was meant to prevent Kohavi <laughs> from actually needing to go under these orders uh, to Washington. Uh, but other than that, I think there's more, more room for discussion uh, right now. Um, there might be, um, I think, a debate beginning between Gantz and Bennett. Bennett might be more of a hardliner. We could see that with uh, Rob Marley, the special envoy uh, on Iranian he affairs. He came to Israel and Bennett said, Israel. I'm not going to meet him. Yeah, yeah. So the Bennett, people Even around Bennett explain. Even though according to protocol, he doesn't have to. Yes, True. but I think yeah. it was a... In a way, it was a subtle message that yeah. Bennett is trying to, to, to keep a distance between him and this issue and, and not to look as if he's supporting uh, the, nego the renewed negotiations between Iran and, um, and uh, the United States other, and, and the European uh, states. Other than that, I think that the, at one point or another, Bennett may be tempted to be proactive about Iran. He may be looking for his legacy. You have to remember that in two years' time, it will be Lapid as the, the, the uh, next the, prime minister, the, if the coalition holds. The clock is ticking. Yeah, and Bennett has to... It's not enough to improve the everyday lives of the Israelis. When he thinks of, his, of himself in terms of historic proportions and so on, he's looking for a legacy. And the danger there is that he might be tempted to do something that Netanyahu didn't do. We're still quite far away from that, but I think that we need to, 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 to consider that as a possibility. Yeah, politicians looking for a legacy always comes with some... Uh, some uh, price to pay. Some warning signs. Dalia, I want to turn to you. We've talked a lot now with Amos and Sima on the Israeli side. A question on the Biden administration. When we hear Secretary of State Blinken saying that other options are on the table, when we hear Biden saying Iran is not going to have a nuclear weapon, period, are they bluffing or is there really a military alternative from the United States side? Look, uh, I think it's important to note that the priority is still getting back and getting Iran back into compliance with this deal. That's priority one. And I think it's important to note that uh, Biden, President Biden, inherited a very bad hand uh, as, um, I hope my internet isn't going here, um, as I think almost laid out. So uh, instead of when Trump withdrew from the deal in 2018, instead of a better deal, um, and a stronger deal uh, and getting Iran more contained, you have um, no better deal and a less contained Iran. And I agree with Avner's concerns about Iran's current nuclear advances, but it's not exactly sneaking out. These are in full sight. Um, the nuclear deal did contain its program. We had incredibly intrusive inspections. We had uh, most of its uranium enrichment shipped out of the country. Um, and we had a lid on the program, not perfect, but we had a lid on it. We do not have any constraints or very few constraints at the moment. So I think the Biden administration's priority is going to be to get back to some semblance of nuclear constraint diplomatically. Now, um, as I said earlier, I think there's a lot of barriers to getting there now, more than there was back in 2015. Uh, there's a lot more mistrust on the Iranian side. They feel they, you know, they fulfilled their side of the deal. They actually were complying with it. We, we, the United States, left. Um, they are asking for more things now. As Seema said, many of these things are not realistic. Uh, it could be just starting positions. 
Um, but, you know, I think there are reasons to believe there's still a chance. I've been quite pessimistic, actually, since the U.S. withdrawal that we can salvage this thing. Um, and certainly the more Iran advances in the program, the more difficult that will be. Uh, but the fact that they're still willing to go to the negotiating table, um, the fact that you may get less regional resistance, um, Israel will certainly be concerned, as I think is expressed here. Um, but the rest of the region is starting to de-escalate with Iran on all kinds of regional issues, uh, Yemen and others. Uh, so you may actually find less regional resistance more support for containing this because the region saw what happened when maximum pressure was uh, enforced on Iran. Iran lashed out and it became a very dangerous neighborhood, oil tankers getting hit, et cetera. So I think a lot of players in the region and the United States does not want to see a repeat of that. Um, but it's going to be hard, no question about it. That's an understatement. Uh, uh, Avner, uh, I want to turn to you uh, and ask you, let's say that we do see the Iranians uh, pushing through and uh, sneaking, as you described it. Do you think at some point this could lead to a change in Israel's uh, strategy of ambiguity on the nuclear file, which you've written a lot about over the years? It's difficult to see it in the foreseeable future. Foreseeable future meaning uh, short of Iran test a nuclear device, which I think is very unlikely. I think Iran has somebody to imitate and to follow, and they have learned it pretty well. I think they would like to be in a position to have all the components, all the requirements very, very close, not just visual material, but also weaponization, militarization of the program, to be in the distance that would not be known by others exactly, but assumed to be maybe weeks away from the bomb. I'm not saying days, but weeks away from the bomb. And to be comfortable around that. And I believe that uh, before Iran goes to a test, and I believe that this is the major difference between them and North Korea. North Korea wanted very much to make a test, to make a visible change in a statement and to create a situation that it's clear and understood by everybody. I don't think that's the case with Iran. In Iran, there is a great deal of ambiguity, in part because there is the fatwa, which for some people against nuclear weapon, it's real, for some people it's pretense, but there is, there is no consensus about it. So even internally, I think it's better for them to shorten the distance from the bomb, to sneak as close as they can, uh, and to push it in a situation that it will be difficult to negotiate over that distance they are getting closer and closer without doing the test. And I believe that the Israeli interest ultimately would be to keep Israeli restraints as long as Iran does not make that kind of overt move. So in response to your question, I do not see in the immediate foreseeable future any change in the Israeli position unless something very dramatic happened. So we're speaking a lot about the nuclear issue, but when we talk about Iran as a strategic threat challenge to Israel, it's not just that. And I want to talk to both of you, Sima and Amos, about this. Amos, first of all, we saw some events in recent uh, days that show again the uh, potential damage that Iran can cause in the regional aspect. We saw uh, attacks in Iraq and in Syria, and there has been some disappointment in Israel around the American response to these events. Can you elaborate a bit? Yes, there's quite a lot of frustration. Uh, most of this is going on behind the scenes. You will not uh, in this government uh, term will you hear uh, Israeli senior officials uh, attacking the United States publicly over its conduct in the region. But when you talk to the senior officials, whether they're from the government or from the IDF, uh, you can hear quite a lot of disappointment about what's going on recently. There were two attacks, one in Tanif, the American base which is closer to the Jordanian and Iraqi borders in eastern Syria. Uh, we were told that a friendly state, so to speak, uh, gave them a prior warning about a possible attack and that the Americans decided to evacuate their troops. And when Iranian uh, drones hit, uh, nobody was hurt, but uh, nothing happened. There was no retaliation from the American side. Then uh, a week or two later, there was the attack 
probably an assassination attempt or at least a message being sent by Shiite uh, uh, Iraqi militias, uh, the attack on the prime minister's uh, home. And then again, America did nothing except for expressing its, um, the fact that it was worried about the situation. So what the Israelis uh, basically are saying is this is going too far. It's one thing that you're willing to discuss uh, resuming negotiations with the Iranians uh, about the nuclear deal. It's another thing that you actually um, uh, refuse to show any kind of force or flex your muscles or do anything. The Americans have tried to, to tell Israel that there's, it's, this is no big deal. And they tried to calm the Israelis down by, for once, uh, one thing they did was send a marine unit to practice with the IDF at the Negev. Another uh, 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 naval exercise uh, that was announced last week. Because there were some Arab states. Yeah, well. and the Israelis were surprised that the Americans, that the Fifth Fleet actually uh, uh, decided to make this public. But there was an announcement regarding the Red Sea. And again, this is. Um, some analysts are saying, well, this is a sign that they, the Americans are supporting Israel and not tough they're against Iran. They're committed, so they're serious. Yeah, but I, I don't think that the Israeli generals are buying this. And I think that like their counterparts in Saudi Arabia and in Iraq and in the Gulf states, they're all um, beginning to realize that there's a change in the American attitude towards the region. Part of this is the famous pivot that uh, President Obama talked about a decade ago, about moving American interests to uh, uh, the Far East, to uh, uh, East Asia, dealing with China and so on. Part of this is, is the general agenda now on the table, and uh, the, the Israelis call it the three Cs. It's uh, climate, uh, China, and COVID. Uh, everything else is less interesting for the Americans. And you hear people in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem being more and more worried about this outcome. Mm -hmm. And Sima, talking on the regional picture, we're also seeing some interesting and contrasting signs about talks between Iran and Arab countries, including some of the Gulf countries that have gotten so close to Israel. How much of a concern is that in Jerusalem these days? Um, I think, first of all, uh, I think it's an, an interesting phenomena. It's not a new one. Actually, Rouhani started with the dialogue with the Saudis, and this government in uh, Iran continues. Uh, it falls within a strategy that uh, the uh, Raisi government is trying to portray, that they will uh, put a major emphasis on relations with neighboring countries. Of course, it's important also economically. They have borders with Turkey, with, uh, with, Saudi, with, uh, the Saudi, uh, with um, Iraq, and they want to have economic relations with those countries uh, through the border, also to uh, circumvent sanctions if it's possible. So I think um, what we see now in the region is an interesting uh, development. Not everything falls within the same uh, uh, the same camp. On one hand, we see Ira Iran um, continuing the dialogue with the uh, Emirates. There was uh, with the Saudis uh, trying to come to terms on some issues, but it's difficult. I mean, the problems are there. The Yemen issue is there. I think it's very difficult. On the other hand, we see uh, Iran having a lot of problems. In Iraq, uh, the last uh, uh, elections, the result of the last elections are very much against the interest of Iran. The militias are less powerful from the point of view of uh, members of parliament than they were in the previous one, and this is something that uh, bothers the Iranians. On the, in Lebanon, we see also a problem. Hezbollah is still the one who is deciding every issue in, Iran, in Lebanon. But at the same time, people are going to the street, are yelling against Hezbollah, against Iran. Uh, so I, I think, uh, and in Syria as well. I mean, Syria was a project that Iran was planning X. It is less than X they wanted. I mean, not only in the, in the nuclear, and not only in the military one, also in the economic one, which the Russians are taking the upper end. So I think, the picture is a mixed one. There are things that are uh, uh, showing uh, an improvement in uh, the way the, the region sees uh, uh, Iran. At the same time, they have a lot of problems. And I think Iraq is something to watch. It's not only the fact that uh, in the election they, they lost. It is also the fact that the current uh, prime minister, we don't know who will be the next pre a pre a prime minister, but the current one was trying to open more and more to the Arab Sunni countries and to a little bit balance the Iranian uh, influence, and I think this is something that worries Iran. So the picture from Jerusalem is also a mixed one. 
And I think uh, the issue of relations of the Abram Accords that uh, we are a year la later, I think they were not... Uh, it's interesting that in spite of the Accords, Iran decided to go and negotiate with those countries, accepting, in a way, the fact that they are in, uh, in agreement with Israel, normalization, and the uh, other hidden relations with uh, Saudis. So uh, the picture is a mixed one. There is a, a concern of what is, will happen, but I don't think that in any time Israel was thinking, people that are dealing with this issue, were thinking that um, relations with the Emirates and with Bahrain will, uh, <laughs> will uh, enable Israel to attack Iran from those countries. Nobody was thinking in those terms. It was important to, to legitimize their relations with Israel and to make them public, but no one, everybody is saying Iran was the cause. Iran is a common interest, but it wasn't the cause. Thank you. And uh, Dalia, turning to you and uh, continuing a bit of the discussion we started here with Sima about Iran's relations with other countries, how significant is the recent agreement that we all read about between Iran and China? Oh, yes. Well, I think just like all regional players are hedging, uh, that's what, what players do. I completely agree with Sima's analysis. Um, uh, Iran also is hedging, and, and this isn't new with the current government. This has been a longstanding uh, evolution of stronger uh, Iranian-Chinese ties. Uh, but I think, you know, we shouldn't exaggerate the strength of this so-called strategic alignment, a new strategic agreement. Um, certainly, uh, Iran is looking east, the new government in particular. It's part of their resilience economy strategy, uh, get, finding workarounds from the Western economic pressure, particularly from the U.S. Um, but, it, you know, China's partners in the region, its priority partners, are still Sunni Arab countries. They import uh, most of their oil from Iraq and Saudi Arabia, not Iran. So um, it's still an important party for China, but China's also balancing a lot of different interests, just like the United States is. So I don't think we should read this as kind of a new axis aligned against us. And I think the United States still has a lot of advantages in the region when it comes to China, and we don't have to compete in every sphere. Um, I just want to say one thing on the pivot, because I almost mentioned it. Um, it gets a lot of play. It's been talked about for years. Uh, I think some members of this administration in Washington believe they are actually executing the pivot now. Um, the recent agreement in, with Australia is evidence of that. Uh, but I think, you know, we also shouldn't exaggerate that either. Um, there's no question across the political spectrum in Washington, there's an interest of doing less, not more in the Middle East. There's a lot of fatigue over 20 years of very costly wars with very little payoff. Uh, Afghanistan was the most recent example, um, uh, tragically. Uh, so I think there is an interest in disengaging to some extent, but we also have to look at reality. Uh, the U.S. still has, uh, give or take, about 50,000 forces in the region, still historically high levels. U.S. aid packages to partners have not changed. You have multi-billion dollar packages, including to the UAE, to execute the, the Abraham Accords, negotiated under Trump administration. Uh, and, uh, and aid to Egypt continues, to, despite some debates about little bits of, of, you know, 130 million out of their $1.3 billion of aid uh, over human rights, but pretty much it's business as usual. So um, I know there's perceptions that the U.S. is turning its back, that it's not responding to every attack, Keep in mind, Iraq is a very sensitive country, a very sensitive moment. The U.S. has to think very carefully about responding with force. Is that even what the current Iraqi government that's quite supportive of the United States would want? Um, is that in the interest of either country? I think these are big questions. So I don't think we should read the U.S. not responding to every provocation by Iran as um, our turning the back on the region. There's just different ways of approaching the region. Military is one uh, tool, but it's not the only tool. Well, we'll see how uh, the generals who uh, brief Amos uh, will respond to this argument. Uh, Avner, turning to you, uh, and again with more historical question that I find personally very interesting what you will answer. When you examine the Iranian program and the steps that they have made, and then you look at the Israeli program that you've studied so much over the years, did they learn anything from us? Can you see some things that are similar or mistakes that they learned from and they executed better? I think a great deal. You know, uh, 
they, uh, <laughs> they illegally translated my book and to Farsi. <laughs> Somebody gave me an article. Illegally meaning you did not get the copyright and the, or, and the all without the... Without buying the copyright, without anything, just did it <laughs> illegally. Uh, somebody got me a copy. Um, I think they've learned a great deal in their own version. They also learned a great deal from the North Korean case. Yeah. And I think they would like very much to have their own case and their own precedent. I think they would like, you know, obviously they have limitations that Israel did not, did, did never, never accepted, did not have. One is being party to the non non-proliferation treaty, to the NPT. But I can see a situation that they, at one point, because of their lack of interest in getting a new, a new, a new deal. I mean, that's the thing that uh, other members of this panel did not emphasize so much. I think that their interest in the deal is simply diminishing. They don't believe it serves so much their interest. I think they are able to do a great deal in terms of the econ economy with their sanctions. And I think they realize that Biden is, is which is true, is inward president, that he has less and less interest in foreign issues, definitely in the Middle East. And he is not going, unless they're going to cross the line by, by testing, which they're not going to do, he is really reluctant to take any actions. One thing that I can see in that kind of historical, but also future-oriented context is, there could be a situation that can even withdraw from the NPT and yet assigned to the can, to the prohibition, to the treaty, to the new treaty that all the nuclear power reject and dismiss of the prohibitions of nuclear weapons. In other words, they would emphasize, we are not into acquiring nuclear weapons. We're going to sign that treaty, but we are, we are discriminated by the NPT. The situation is different and we are leaving the NPT. I don't think it will happen anytime soon, but I can think it's a possibility. Because, because one of the issues that I think they see is that the Biden administration provides much less support to the non-proliferation regime and to the issue of the NPT. He simply is less interested in that. Of course, he would like to keep it, but he is ready to take actions and to, 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 to show it by deed much less, uh, possibly even less than the Trump administration. And I think the Iranians are watching and they see all that. So I think the situation is quite dark. And uh, it's, I think the Iranian, the Iranian are having much more cards than the IC. Um, and um, it's, it's, it's not a nice uh, situation. And I was uh, watching uh, Sima nodding here and uh, you guys seem to be in agreement. Uh, Sima, how does Israel live with the kind of scenario that Avner just painted where it's, Iran doesn't have a bomb, but it's clearly a nuclear state? I think from, uh, from Israel's point of view, and not only, uh, Iran was uh, in uh, weeks, as Avner has said, weeks from a bomb, um, is uh, dangerous the same as if they have a bomb. It's not declared the same way, but it is uh, dangerous the same. Because at the end of the day, what does it mean to have a nuclear cap military nuclear capability? It means you can uh, threaten the other side uh, with conventional uh, military. Uh, 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 you have, you have better cards to play. Exactly. So even being some weeks from a bomb, uh, they don't have to pay the price that they would will pay once they have a nuclear test. Uh, at the same time, do, they will have the same leverage vis-a-vis uh, -vis Israel uh, when it comes to a conventional uh, conflict. So I think uh, from Israel's point of view, it is the same. And that's the reason that uh, the difference between, one of the reasons, be, the difference between Israel and the US. The US is saying, we will not allow Iran to have a nuclear bomb. Israel is asking to have, to have a commitment. We will not allow Iran to be close to the possibility to have a nuclear bomb. And this is a huge difference. That's the whole story right there. And yeah. most continuing on what Avner and Sima just described, where does the military capability of Israel stand today, as much as we can say? And how does it compare to the discussions that you described of 10 years ago? As I mentioned, I'm not sure that Israel was that close to being capable of bombing Iranian nuclear sites and achieving something uh, a decade ago. There was this ongoing discussion, but then the, at the end, both Netanyahu and Barak, who was then his defense minister, hesitated for different reasons, but no order was given to the army. Um, 
apparently during the last five or six years, the IDF and especially the Air Force were busy with other plans and other uh, military activity. Uh, we know that the government has decided to allocate more funds uh, to uh, this um, Iranian military option, and we know that some of the money was actually earmarked for uh, the IDF in order for it to, um, um, to advance its preparations, uh, to be uh, begin uh, exercises, and, and, and so on. This will take time. But even then, we have to look at the operational situation, which means that Iran is actually more prepared for an attack because its anti-aircraft systems have improved, and because some of these sites are now much deeper underground than they were 10 years ago. And on top of everything else, there's the strategic discussion. How will the international community react? What will this do to Israel's relationship with Western European countries, but more than anything else, with uh, Washington? How would the Biden, uh, Biden administration react? I think that it's not really in the cards and, right and now. And how would Iran react? Though? Yeah, of course. And, and maybe that's the, maybe the, the worst, we, we should mention the worst uh, last. Uh, Iran has not been building Hezbollah's military arsenal for uh, more than 20 years just for the for the sake of uh, pleasure i mean this is in the end this is the gun that will uh, will shoot uh, uh, towards the end of the play and if israel does decide to attack uh, there are more than 100,000 rockets and missiles and mortar bombs that may be used against israel this doesn't mean the destruction of israel this doesn't mean the end of the zionist state but it will be a much more dangerous war than anything we've encountered since the uh, Yom Kippur War of 1973. So I think if Bennett or somebody after Bennett would be faced with that dilemma, he needs to consider all these aspects. And I'm not too sure that any Israeli uh, leader would rush to a decision to strike the Iranian sites. That, that's correct, but I have to also say the other side of the coin. And the other do. side, And the other side is that it will be very difficult for any prime minister in Israel to ignore a situation where Iran is reaching the point where it will have... I mean, uh, I, I agree all the reasons that were said by Amos, of no question, but uh, I think uh, on the other side, it will be very difficult. And um, I don't know who will be the prime minister at that time, but I think he will be... Um, he will not want to take upon himself what uh, Amos has said at the beginning, the legacy for the future and to be the one who allowed Iran at the end of the day to get to that point. Well, it's in the impossible dilemma for everyone. Right now, what we're seeing the Bennett mostly do is uh, say, look what I inherited from Netanyahu. Yeah. Yeah. Well, probably has a good point. Uh, Dalia, I, I want to go to you now and ask, continuing on the question to Amos, do the Iranians believe Israel could actually strike them? I think so. I, I mean, look, Iran has been building these asymmetric capabilities, the missile arsenal that almost referred to uh, uh, through Hezbollah, through its own indigenous development, um, its proxies, the non-state actors, not always doing what Iran would like, but still a very important lever. Um, you see their maritime capabilities and, of course, their nuclear development. Is, is not just because they want to bomb for the bomb's sake or prestige. It is another part of their asymmetric uh, arsenal to be able to offset the overwhelming conventional superiority, including of the Israelis and certainly the Americans, and their ability to conventionally attack Iran's homeland. So it is developing all of these capabilities as a deterrent to prevent this kind of attack. So I think they, they do take it seriously. Um, but I think they do feel they have enough or sufficient deterrent um, signaling uh, to possibly prevent it. But I, I also think it's important to note that it's not like everyone's sitting on their hands waiting for this big military strike. And we've been through these military strike debates many, many times. Um, this is like a back to the future discussion. And the reason it has not been undertaken is because of all of this political, uh, of this strategic, political, military fallout, but also because of the very basic fact that it is not clear you can eradicate Iran's drive to nuclear capability should it decide to move in that direction for weapons uh, through a military strike. It has the technical know-how. You certainly can set it back. Uh, but I think, and Avner can speak to this, historically, it is very difficult to bomb a program out of existence yeah, once so you've we, gotten that kind of scientific know-how. So we have really one minute left, and, and Avner, I want to give you the last question exactly continuing on what Dalia said. 
Is there historical precedence that can give us some optimism on the end ending of this story or not at all? Well, um, there is no. I mean, I, mean, I mean, we're not going to have the case of South Africa. Short of change of regime in Iran, I think that Iran would continue with its desire to be closer and closer to the bomb. There is one element that we don't know, and it's an element of uncertainty, and this is the issue of cyber. What cyber can do uh, in a non-kinetic way uh, in terms of uh, not just as, a, as the beginning, as the first uh, blow for, for military actions, but in itself. Uh, Stuxnet was, was uh, you know, 12 years ago, more than that, and it was partially successful, not completely, and definitely bought some time. But the area of cyber is still mysterious to, to many because we don't know what nations have in their arsenal, what they are planning. And it's quite possible that that could be a kind of surprise uh, for the future. But we'll have, uh, uh, yes. we'll, we'll, we'll yes. have to wait and see. Friends, we're out of time. I want to thank you, Avner Cohen, Dalia Dasake, Sima Shine, and Amos Royal for a fascinating discussion. I certainly learned a lot, and I'm sure many of our viewers as well. So thank you all for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.